the Gallipoli campaign. The Anzac spirit, Simpson and his donkey, comfortable legends for politicians to wave a flag around a hundred years after the fighting. But why did so many die? Who sent them to fight? And how did things go so badly wrong? The First World War was a battle of empires in a world that had reached the limits of imperial expansion. In the decades before 1914, the European powers, the United States and Japan, had carved up the world between them. Now if you wanted more colonies, you had to take them, not off defenceless indigenous peoples, but off another world power who had already laid claim to them. Well before 1914, eager eyes had been cast on the Ottoman Empire, ruled by an ancient lineage of sultans, still vast in extent, but also in serious decline. As early as 1908, the British had told Russia that in the event of a new European war, Moscow could annex the Ottoman capital Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. Seven years later, a British planning committee confirmed the Russians could have the city and set out to finalise London's own ambitions. Early in March last, the Russian government, anticipating an early and successful issue to the operations which have been started at the Dardanelles, communicated to the Allied governments its claims in regard to Constantinople. His Majesty's government agreed generally to the Russian proposals. The next step was, therefore, for His Majesty's government to formulate their definite desiderata in Asiatic Turkey. What the British had on their list came down to one short word, oil. The ships of the Royal Navy were converting from coal to oil, and the richest oil fields of the day were in Iraq, then a Turkish province, and Persia, modern-day Iran. Turkey entered the First World War on the 5th of November 1914. The very next day, British troops landed at Basra to cement British control over the oil resources of the Middle East. So, money and trade, the age-old motive for war. These explain why the Gallipoli campaign unfolded but who ordered the invasion of Turkey? The Gallipoli campaign was authorised by the British Liberal government, led by Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith, here laid to rest in the pretty yard of the All Saints Church, Sutton Courtney, Oxfordshire. Asquith was a politician of achievement, having pushed through important social reforms before the war. But not to put too fine a point on it, he was also a dirty old man, with a fondness for drink to boot. As Europe stood aghast at the horrors of the Western Front in the winter of 1914-15, Asquith was pursuing his latest young lady. Aged 62, he was besotted by aristocratic socialite Venetia Stanley, 35 years his junior. The other politician at the heart of the Gallipoli adventure was, of course, Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, political head of the Royal Navy. Impetuous, indifferent to methodical planning, Churchill's boyish enthusiasm for the war was matched only by his thirst for alcohol. The high living of the British politicians was part of the hedonistic social milieu around the Asquith government. Asquith's eldest son, Raymond, was a member of the Coterie, a society circle that included Venetia Stanley and at least one of Asquith's cabinet colleagues, notorious for its consumption of alcohol and morphine. So these were the Edwardian dilettantes who sent so many men to their deaths. But what did the Australian government know? On the 2nd of March 1915, six weeks before the landing, London told Australia and New Zealand that the Anzacs were on their way to Gallipoli, but this was for information only. The Australian government had so little to do with the decision making that the fighting would be underway for nearly three months before the Australian politicians asked for maps with enough detail to allow them to work out where their troops were. So with this combination of naked imperial ambition and political ineptitude, Britain set out to conquer Turkey. The British aimed to force the Dardanelles, the waterway between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, 
and then bombard Constantinople into submission. First, Churchill egged on his admirals, against their better judgment, to make the attempt with ships alone, sending a massive fleet to attack the Turkish forts guarding the Straits on the 18th of March 1915. The result was a disaster. The might of the Royal Navy was effectively brought undone by a single Turkish ship, the tiny Nuzret. In the dead of night, the Nuzret secretly laid a line of naval mines in the path of the Allied fleet. Blundering onto them, three battleships were sunk in short order and the British withdrew. Back in London, the Asquith government digested this defeat, albeit the Prime Minister had other things on his mind. My darling, you have just left me and I feel very desolate. You were, as you always are, your real self today. Sweet, resolute and deceiving. I know no woman and have never known one who could be in any comparable degree all three things at once. I don't say there is no pain in it, but it is at such moments, in the fresh bitterness of parting, and with the clouded uncertainties of an impenetrable future, that I realise how wise and heaven-blessed I was to have found and appropriated and encased in my heart of hearts what the scripture calls the pearl of great price. What battleships couldn't do, men with rifles would. The British assembled an army, including the Anzacs, and put General Sir Ian Hamilton in charge of it. Hamilton personified the Edwardian British Army. Generals got jobs not on merit, but because they were next in line or knew someone of influence. He had some good ideas, but not the drive to force subordinates to implement them. Even Asquith thought Hamilton had too much feather in his brain. With events in the balance, Asquith turned to Venetia Stanley for advice. Hankey has just been in, very anxious about the Dardanelles, which he says Robertson, chief of French's staff, describes as the stiffest operation anyone could undertake. Now that things look better with Italy and Romania, Hankey strongly urges postponement, lest a check there should set back the whole situation. There is a great deal of force in this. What do you think? History does not record what Venetia Stanley thought Asquith should do. Meanwhile, Hamilton came up with a complicated plan to force the issue. This involved landings in two different sectors. The first on a wide, flat beach north of a point called Gaba Tepe, on the west coast of the peninsula. Here, Hamilton gave the Anzacs their role to seize high ground running south from the high point of Chanak Bear. They were commanded by British General William Birdwood. He had some bright ideas, but not all of them were good ones. To achieve surprise, Birdwood landed the Anzacs at night, but the consequence was that they were landed in the wrong spot, carried north by the current to land here at North Beach under these horrendous cliffs. The key feature of which, of course, is the aptly named Sphinx. Landing in places like this, in the dark and further south at Anzac Cove itself, the Australians and New Zealanders were soon in desperate trouble. Men had no idea where they were and their officers soon lost control as units were swallowed up in the gullies and scrub-covered ravines. But the Anzacs were also beaten by a brilliant general, Mustafa Kamel, later the founder of modern Turkey. Unlike Hamilton, who watched events passively and did nothing to influence the outcome of the battle, Kamal took decisive action and counterattacked hard. And the bravery of his troops was without peer. Of the Turkish 57th Infantry Regiment, which led the charge, not a single man survived the war. With the Anzacs stuck on the cliff tops further south at Cape Helles, Hamilton landed the British 29th Division at five separate beaches. The 29th was led by General Hunter Weston, the kind of dull-witted officer oblivious to casualties that gave rise to the caricature of the incompetent British commander, Colonel Blimp. 
Hunter Weston's objective was a small hill that dominated the southern tip of the peninsula, Archibaba. Archibaba, not much of a hill to die for, but thousands did. And when you reach the summit, it's clear why. The view from that little hill dominates the entire southern end of the Dardanelles Peninsula. And so it was to reach this point that the British set themselves on the 25th of April 1915. The landings at each flank at Helles, at S Beach and Y Beach were surprisingly successful. This beautiful spot is Y Beach and the place where the British came closest to complete success on the 25th of April. Ian Hamilton himself selected the place as somewhere where a surprise landing might be made and the two battalions who landed here achieved just that. They climbed these cliffs completely unopposed and then did nothing. The problem was that the British stuck to their plan rather than exploited success where they found it. The forces at Y Beach and S Beach were only meant to protect the main landings at X, W and the largest of all, V Beach. At these places, the invading troops were shot down en masse by Turkish infantry firing from strongly fortified positions. Hunter Weston, lacking the imagination to change a plan going badly wrong, sent his men into this fire until at V Beach the sea ran red with their blood. The 29th Division, like the Anzacs, eventually won a toehold ashore, but that was all. Failure on the first day could never be recovered and Gallipoli became a siege despite another attempted landing further north at Suvla Bay in August 1915. Gallipoli ended in defeat for the British and the Anzacs in December 1915 when the remaining troops were evacuated. 2,779 New Zealanders and 8,709 Australians would die at Gallipoli but the British eventually got what they wanted the Iraqi oil fields. It would take another three years of mass slaughter on the Western Front, but when the First World War ended, Britain took possession of Iraq under an international mandate. Gallipoli, lest we forget the facts. Mm -hmm.